Uh, now we'll move on to uh, some deep learning for chemistry. Uh, it's my pleasure to invite uh, Jennifer today for a talk on uh, deep learning for chemistry. You work at Google Brain uh, and she's a PhD from Harvard. Thank you. Hi everyone. Um, yeah, so I'm here today to talk to you about some of the projects that I worked on during my PhD, which was focused on applying machine learning to various chemistry applications. So by way of a very general introduction, uh, some of the problems that we care about when we say that we're trying to uh, find a molecule that will solve problems in chemistry might look like the following. Uh, we're looking for a molecule that satisfies particular properties. So for example, in drug discovery, we're interested in finding a molecule that'll fit in exactly this binding pocket inside of a protein, which might be your drug target. In the case of something like flow batteries, we care about finding molecules that have the right reduction potential so that um, when they're cycled a thousands, thousands, tens of thousands of times, during this flow battery's lifetime, it's stable and it has the right reduction potential. So how does the um, pipeline look like for uh, finding these molecules? Uh, first, somebody proposes these molecules and they usually use their intuition or they use uh, maybe some results, some calculation to propose a set of molecules. And then they, another person has to propose synthesis for all the proposed molecules. Um, and then actually go and synthesize the molecules. And once you synthesize the molecules, you have to characterize the molecules for the pro to make sure that they have the properties that you wanted, as well as to make sure that the, what the um, product that you synthesized is pure. And so you repeat this and propose new molecules, and the cycle can take one to two months per cycle. And this is really slow, especially when you consider the fact that chemical space is absurdly large. Um, it's very easy to uh, make small tweaks to a molecule, just change the functional groups at the side, and you'll get a common internal explosion of, mole of molecule space. So it's very difficult to search for molecules that will solve particular problems if you do it in just a linear fashion. And so this is what got us motivated to think about ways of applying machine learning to uh, chemical discovery. Um, throughout this talk, in addition to telling you about my project, I hope I can leave you with a couple of lessons that I've learned anyways about how to think about machine learning, how to apply machine learning to chemistry problems. Um, in particular, um, I think it's really important to be able to frame both of the input representation and the uh, targets as so something that machine learning can model. So you have to find a way to discretize your inputs and discretize the output, the target output, in order for it to be rep representable in machine learning. Um, Obviously, the other uh, big constraint is uh, finding a data set that's large enough to do what you want to cover the, all the input space that you're, you care about. And finally, uh, as much as possible, try to apply scientific knowledge and scientific intuition into your models. It really does help the performance. Okay, so representing non-regular inputs. Uh, molecules can vary in the number of atoms they have and the number of bonds they have, and this makes for a rather complicated representation problem compared to, say, images, where um, you can always have the same number of pixels. And so how do we handle this? Um, for 40 or 50 years now, the drug discovery community has already thought of some solutions to this problem. One solution is to uh, express this graph as a text string. And so you see here that uh, different Fragments of the molecule correspond to different parts of the text string, and the opening and closing of these rings are also represented by numbers. So there's it's a very uh, grammar-focused um, uh, string text-based representation that you can use to represent molecules. Another representation is uh, a local structure fingerprint. So what happens is uh, you'll capture local environments around a particular atom, and you'll store that the presence of that feature inside of a vector representation. And these vectors can, are typically binary or they can also be uh, counting. So it's just, it's a count of the number of features that you have that kind within the graph. Um, the last representation, which I won't go into that much, but it's gaining a lot of traction right now, is the graph convolutional networks that I think you've heard a bit about today. Um, and basically how those work is it's similar to the fingerprint idea, except um, rather than having a discrete representation for each sub feature, uh, they become encoded into this continuous representation that's localized around the nodes of the graph representation. Um, if you're interested in uh, learning more about general representations, I encourage you to check out this uh, review written by my lab mate, Ben. Okay, um, so the first project that uh, I'll talk about is uh, applying variational autoencoders to uh, machine learning discovery. So, um, the motivation for this is that typically your machine learning algorithms 
you have input molecules, you train a machine learning algorithm to predict you some properties that you care about. And once you've trained this well, uh, you can go back and iterate and generate new molecules that you can uh, then feed through and actually test some of these in the lab once you're satisfied with the, um, with the molecules that you've gotten, with the predictions that you've made for these molecules. But this can be rather slow, right? Like it might take you some time to realize that after you synthesize it, that, oh, there's an error in your prediction or, oh, there's um, some other error. So it would be helpful if you could just uh, generate the best molecules from the beginning, or at least generate the best mo molecules as proposed by the model first and see whether you can predict those. Um, and so th the way that this works then is we wanted a model where you can feed in both the molecules and the properties, you feed it to machine learning algorithm, and then it outputs uh, what it thinks are the best mo mo molecules. And so this takes a couple of steps. The first step really is to be able to uh, compress the representation of molecular space down from 10 to the 60 to something more manageable. So the way we did this is by using a variational autoencoder. So, uh, we use the variational encoder. The first part of it is a convolutional neural network, um, taking in this text representation, and we end up compressing this representation down to an order of 100 dimensions. Uh, then uh, we use a recurrent neural network to decode the latent representation to try to get the same output. So this is focusing on the reconstruction. It turns out, though, that there's no reason you need to stop at only um, using the autoencoder to um, encode and decode the molecule, right? Like this is also a valid representation of a molecule now. It's a learned representation of a molecule. So what we then did was to use this latent representation to predict uh, a target property that we cared about. And the idea here is that now that we have this smooth representation of molecule space, in addition to optimizing, um, in, we, we can associate this uh, representation with a property and therefore we can optimize by optimizing on this property surface we can also optimize in this latent space and decode to get the whatever molecule. Um, so we did this with a toy example. Um, we did this with uh, molecules from the zinc data set which is this collection of drug molecules and we subsampled it so and took 250,000 molecules. Um, the labels, the properties that we were predicting here are all chemical, chemical cheminformatic descriptors. And the reason for this is that it's possible to have values for all of our molecules in our data set cheaply. Um, so this is what the latent space looks like, roughly speaking, when you train it with just the autoencoder. Um, I'm showing you the coloring scheme is the value of the uh, log p, which is a rough equivalent rough measure of the solubility of a molecule. And you can see that the organization of the latent space is pretty disordered. Versus if you do train it with the, um, the, the two-pronged network that I showed you, the joint, um, the property prediction uh, autoencoder, you end up with a distribution of points such that the higher values are in one part of the latent space and the lower values are all in the other part of the latent space. Um, and indeed, uh, we, uh, we did use this too for optimization. We selected molecules with a low percentile, usually in the, in the bottom of 20% uh, of our objective value. And we were able to use this latent space combined with some optimization techniques to find new molecules that had really high uh, property values according to our model. So I think this work demonstrates that optimization is possible when you do have a large label data set and when the properties that you want to predict are pretty smooth. But I think there are some obvious caveats. Um, in particular, we struggled a lot with trying to uh, have the molecules generated be actually feasible. In some cases, this text string generated had grammar issues or um, the molecule that it produced when it was correct uh, was actually not synthesizable. And there's been a lot of work recently on finding ways to um, make ensure that the molecules that, that are generated are actually feasible, either by applying a grammar rule, to, to like a, using a grammar variational encoder to ensure that the spring output is correct, or trying to generate uh, molecules directly by building it up from, up from fragments or even building it up from reactions. There's been a couple of papers in this vein. Um, another big issue is that this doesn't work well for small data sets yet. Uh, but there needs to be more work done in terms of uh, finding ways to apply the learned representation in towards uh, data sets that are much smaller than 250,000 molecules, um, either by using a transfer learning approach or by maybe using a semi-supervised approach for cases where uh, you can use some other property that, um, um, the, the, so in the cases where like uh, in drug discovery, you might only have a couple of 100 label examples, maybe you can have some other property that's correlated with that property that where you can have many more data points, many more labeled examples, and uh, use that to help your model, training your model. 
Um, the other big issue with this is that uh, for properties that are not smooth, um, this becomes a complicated optimization problem as well. So it may be difficult to use this towards optimizations of those problems. Uh, the next topic I'd like to talk about is uh, synthesis of uh, molecules. So as I said before, uh, in addition to these molecules being really different, they all have very different synthetic pathways. And so the problem of synthesis is a problem of trying to identify which are the building blocks that you need, which are the reactions that you need to um, eventually synthesize these molecules. So an organic chemist would look at a molecule like this and see that, oh, this is a particularly weak bond that um, would be good to form the molecule across this bond and may propose that uh, these molecules can be used to synthesize this molecule. Um, but for most molecules that uh, chemists care about, they usually are much larger, and so they might require 20 or 40 steps. So even to just generate the synthetic root could take you roughly an hour, let alone synthesizing the molecule could take a lot of time. And so this becomes a major bottleneck in this uh, proposal pipeline. Like if you're trying to accelerate this process, then even it's not helpful that you can generate thousands of candidates in an hour if your synthesis pathway relies on somebody who need, you know, to sit there and generate a synthetic pathway. So the goal here then is to try to think of, uh, make a calculator, make a tool for people to help make this process faster. Uh, so what do I mean? So how do we frame the reaction prediction problem or the synthesis problem in a way that a machine learning algorithm can understand it? So when we think about reaction prediction, we're asking what, how do um, the combination of these two molecules, which I'll call reactants on this side of the arrow, and this product um, interact? Uh, so like how will, what kind of product will these, these molecules form? Uh, meanwhile, the retrosynthesis problem is kind of is the opposite problem, where like given a target molecule, how, what, build, what steps should I take to synthesize that molecule? Uh, the data sets, I'll focus mostly on reaction predictions for now. The data sets for reaction prediction are um, one that's the USPTO data set. So this is a data set of reactions that somebody scraped from, uh, all, from patent literature, basically. And another one is the reaccess collection. And this is not an open source reaction database, but um, it's been scraped from uh, all the publications of reactions. So again, going back to the question of how do we frame uh, reaction prediction in a way that a machine learning algorithm can generate prediction? One way of doing this is by trying to predict a reaction template. So what I mean is that uh, given these reaction molecule inputs, um, I want to try to predict which template, which reaction is most likely to occur. You can think of this roughly as uh, when you play chess, uh, when they made chess playing algorithms, uh, they also similarly need to predict which move uh, was the most like was going to help them win the game. So this is a similar idea. We, uh, in my case here for this paper, we use a generated set of reactions, and so I constrained the space to only consider sixteen different kinds of reactions. Um, right. So then the process of predicting these uh, reactions is. Um, trying to, is a multi, it becomes a classification task then, trying to classify which reaction type is most likely to occur. And once you know which reaction type is most likely to occur, you can apply that transformation rule to your reactants to generate a product. So this is one way of framing the reaction prediction question. And another way that has been a lot more popular in recent years is to uh, predict the product directly. And so what I mean by this is, well, here's one example uh, done by Wing Ong Jin and his collaborators at MIT. And so, what happens here is uh, they look at the molecule graph and they try to predict which atoms are most likely to react. Uh, and once they select which, molecule, which atoms within the molecule are most likely to react, they gen generate all of the possible candidate structures that can form from the reaction of those particular atoms. So what would happen if you combine all of the, if you make all the possible um, connections between the atoms or break all the possible connections between the atoms, and then they rank those outputs to generate the, and then predict which, out, which candidate is the most likely to generate the product of the reactants. So we're doing fairly well on this data set. Uh, reaction prediction is about 91, the last, the most recent paper is um, that it reported an accuracy of 91% on the reaction prediction task. And for synthesis generation, which is kind of the reverse problem, we're getting about 63.3% of uh, the correct, correctly predicted reaction synthetic roots in the top 10 matches. But there are also, again, caveats here in that um, the data sets are, for reaction prediction are quite limited. Um, 
In particular, the scope of the reactions included in the data sets can be somewhat limiting. Um, and also there's a lot of noise within the data sets. So for example, many reactions might not include alcohol or water as one of their reactions or reagents because to that community, um, everybody already uses alcohol or water. So it's a, in sort of implied for them, but when we go to train a neural network for reactions, then that might, not, that might be useful information that shouldn't be implied, that should be added. The other big issue is that a lot of reaction data sets don't include very many negative reactions or examples of reactions that don't work. And this is a huge liability for uh, when you're trying to predict reactions, because if you only see positive examples, you don't see any negative examples, then you won't actually know which ones of these kinds of reactions will or will not work. Okay, so the last project that I would like to talk about today is um, this uh, is uh, one on characterization. So for this model, we tried to we take an input molecule and we tried to predict its electron ionization mass spectra. So what is mass spectrometry about? Well, let's say you have some molecule that you don't know what its identity is. One way you can, one process you can take to try to identify the molecule is to ionize it with an electron beam and then accelerate it through an electromagnetic field to get a spectra. And the spectra is then uh, basically a histogram of the resulting ions from the ionization of the molecules and it's sorted by its mass to charge ratio. And then what do you do with this spectrum? Uh, one common practice is to look this spectrum up in a library of uh, mass spe uh, collected mass spectra. So there's been libraries curated by NIST and Wiley, and you can then look up your, your query spectrum in this reference library. And the idea is that the top matching spectrum from the library should be represent should be your query. Like you would hope that uh, this spectrum, if it matches the spectrum perfectly, um, then this molecule that corresponds to that spectrum should give you the identity of the molecule, of your query molecule. Um, but this is an issue if your molecule is not in the library, right? Like, especially in our case, if we're synthesizing, proposing a lot of molecules that aren't in the original, that you know, are brand new to solve new problems, uh, maybe they're not in libraries currently. So in which case you can't use the library matching technique as given, or you can't use existing libraries to help identify whether or not this molecule is in is is correct. So as a result, what we what we're saying is that uh, I, what you'd want to do is to expand the existing libraries to include new molecules. So how do you expand the existing libraries? So and so the idea is that if you once you expand the existing libraries, you would be able to find matches in um, some matches in the augmented portion of the data set of in the augmented part of the library. So thereby helping to increase the coverage of the existing libraries. So how do we get new spectra? One way is to just uh, make the molecules and then generate the spectra. But as you can imagine, this is a very costly process and it might be difficult to tell how pure the sample is. Another method is to um, use quantum mechanics to simulate the fragmentation events. Uh, and so there's been pretty good success with this, but um, as, because you have to model the fragmentation events, it becomes a very costly calculation. It can take up to 10 minutes per molecule. Uh, there's been efforts by the Wishart Lab to predict the uh, fragmentation and behavior using uh, machine learning. So uh, the, it's an interesting approach, actually. They look at the molecular graph and they try to predict the fragmentation probability across each bond and then use that to um, aggregate the results into a spectra. And this is a lot faster than quantum mechanics predictions, but it still takes a while for some of the larger molecules since it needs to consider all the bonds within the molecule. Yeah, the problem is time. I'm mostly talking about this on the basis of assuming that you want to generate uh, predictions of spectra for thousands of molecules within an hour. Yeah, I mean, it definitely depends on your constraints, right? Like, I mean, if you have the time to generate um, spectra using, or to predict spectra using quantum mechanics for all of the molecules in your data set, then I think that's probably still the way to go. But um, it's just, if you want to generate these quickly, then maybe, like, you can imagine that in some cases you want to generate spectra for a million molecules. And so if you need a million molecules by 10 minutes, it's going to be a really long time. Perhaps you would like to generate them more quickly with a rough estimate. It, it just depends on what, what your goal is. All right, so what we propose here then is to try to predict the spectra directly. So instead of, uh, we have an end-to-end -end prediction process where we take in the um, incoming fingerprint representation and uh, try to uh, predict the spectra. And so here in our case, we represent the spectra as a multidimensional regression task. So uh, we consider all bins from one to a thousand and try to 
uh, predict the intensity of each of those events. So I want to take a moment here to talk about, oh, sorry, let me, so the data set for this prediction is the, um, we use the NIST library itself for the prediction task. There's about 250,000 spectra in that prediction task. Um, and it also comes with this collection of 30,000 replicate spectra. And so these replicate spectra are interesting in that uh, these molecules, uh, the spectra from these molecules were considered too noisy to be part of the main library collection. But that's just perfect for us because we consider them as a model for uh, the spectra that you might receive from an actual query sample. So our setup then for evaluating the model is to choose molecules from the replicates library and match them against the library that contains predicted spectra both for the replicate molecules and for some other molecules in the main library. And then we try to find the match for the query spectrum in the library. And the metric that we want to focus on most is, that we focus on most is whether or not the correct match came up in the top 10 match results from the library. Uh, so I'd like to take a moment then to talk about the importance of accounting for physical phenomena in your models. So in mass spectrometry, uh, it's, you get two ions, right? It's possible to get both a small ion that corresponds to this, the actual fragment that's broken off. So in this case, we have a methyl group that's breaking off. And this, if it gets a positive charge after the ionization event, then you have a peak at 15. Um, but if the opposite happens, if the positive charge ends up on the uh, larger fragment, then you get a peak at, um, in this case, it's 58 minus 15, which is 43. Now, what happens if I consider the same event for a larger molecule? For a larger molecule, then your molecular mass is 72. And um, if the positive charge goes on the smaller fragment, then you still have a mass at 15. But if the larger, if the, frag if the positive charge goes on the larger fragment now, then this is the same um, fragmentation event, but now the peak occurs at 57, just because the molecular mass of the molecule is different. Um, so if you're interested, you can read more about the way that we applied this technique in the model. But basically, we had the model account for the molecular mass. We gave the molecule the molecular mass in the prediction process to help it make predictions about each bin. And this has um, had a significant result. So what I'm showing you here, this is the baseline prediction. So if you're using the original NIST um, reference library to perform this library matching, then uh, this is the best possible performance you could receive. Um, if you use a linear regression model instead of the full multilayer perceptron model I showed you before, you get about 4% accuracy. By including this uh, molecular mass into the prediction, uh, you can get uh, 20, 20 points better prediction, uh, prediction, and this is just on the linear regression model. Um, if you consider both modes, if you consider both counting from zero and counting from the molecular mass in your, uh, for the charge, uh, for the, the spectra prediction, you get about 10 points improvement. And the same thing follows for using the full uh, multilayer perceptron model. Uh, so yeah, we were able to uh, achieve pretty high accuracy with a uh, significantly faster runtime using this approach. So the extensions of this would be to try to consider this for uh, smaller classes of molecules, but again, you have to be, uh, you have to make sure that you have enough examples to represent uh, the spectra in this case. Uh, and then you can also imagine using this to predict other kinds of spectra. So um, yeah, to go back to my points at the beginning of lessons that I've learned about applying machine learning, um, I think it's really important to consider, in my case, to consider the representations both of the molecules and of the problems that we want to frame, that we want to address in, in machine learning. Like the key to being able to use machine learning for science is to be able to find ways of representing your inputs and representing your outputs in ways that are vectorized that you can then use a machine learning algorithm to predict. Um, I also, obviously, it's also important to find a reasonably large data set for, that covers the range of inputs that you care about. Um, the definitions of reasonably large will vary for different applications. And finally, as demonstrated by the last project, it's really important to apply uh, scientific knowledge and apply intuitions that you already know. It's just, so it's just, you need a domain expertise to really have successful models in this task. Uh, with that, I would like to thank my advisor, Alon, um, and members of his lab, as well as the brain members of the Rue brain team that had helped me with the last project. And thank you all for your attention.